Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you to the department, obviously, for some amazing support as I get started here. Um, and thank you all for coming today. So I want to introduce uh, the context of obesity. Um, and I know it's something we're all familiar with, but I want to put some numbers to this because it really helps to put it in context. Uh, so in terms of the cost of obesity globally, we're spending over $2 trillion per year in US dollars in obesity globally. And this is contributed by uh, increased disease risk, obviously, and healthcare costs, which are also rising globally. And I did a comparison between China and the United States uh, to look at obesity. And I thought this really put it in perspective. Uh, so in China, in terms of the actual frequency of the population that are obese, it's relatively low compared to the US, uh, but roughly twice the number of people. So this is a significant problem there and a growing problem, uh, given that a large, a growing population of children are um, obese there. And that's going to, in the future, obviously be an even bigger problem. In the US, we know we're approaching 40% obesity and that it's about 93 million people at this point, costing over $300 billion per year. So these costs are becoming astronomical and um, accounting for more and more of our health care costs. But you know, it's always amazing to see that Chinese number, it's only 13 percent, and it's rising exponentially, as you know. But look at that, 177 million people. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And it seems to be related to um, migration to the cities as well. So I think this is. Um, there is definitely a lot to look at there. Um, so we know that obesity, the, the major risks with this are insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, a risk for a liver disease and atherosclerosis, cardiovascular problems, um, and also, of course, secondary conditions related to that. Um, so this adds up to an enormous um, burden and cost and um, increased mortality, of course. So how can we approach improving health in obesity? Um, there really isn't a, a good strategy to combat this, despite a lot of effort going into it. Um, so the first is, of course, to manage the disease itself, uh, as well as promote weight loss in a medical setting. So working with a physician to uh, promote weight loss. However, uh, studies have been done looking at actual impacts here. Um, and in many studies, they find that around 5% um, of 5% of the population that undergoes some kind of medical weight loss actually benefits in terms of remission of diabetes. So the second option now is bariatric surgery. And we know, so I'm just showing some examples of bariatric surgery here to give you an idea of how drastic this can be. Um, so gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, where they um, trim portion of the stomach but retain um, nutrient absorption within the stomach, and then um, bands, like the lap band approach. So we find that with this, we can get about 50% diabetes remission. But again, this also means that 50% of people who undergo this procedure actually don't benefit. So how can we better predict who is going to benefit from this procedure? And obviously, a lot of uh, cellular components are going into this, um, uh, including uh, appetite regulation and brain circuitry that goes into this. And so if we can better understand the tissue dynamics behind obesity, what's changing, what cellular components are changing, we may be able to get a better handle on why obesity leads to disease. So another thing to mention, obesity seems to have a long-term risk as well. So if we look at um, lean adults that were obese as children, they actually carry over still a risk of uh, cardiovascular disease um, and diabetes. So something to keep in mind um, that even when you can reachieve a lean state, uh, there's still a high risk. So what can we do to better understand what's going on in obesity? So looking here, we can see a cross-section of adipose tissue. To give you an idea of the cell types um, I'm, going to, I'm going to mention today. Um, so in this cross-section, we can see adipocytes in blue. 
uh, vascular endothelial cells. So we can see those along these structures with red nuclei. And then also macrophages here in green. Uh, we call these ATMs for adipose tissue macrophages. Um, and when, and when I joined Kerry Lu Meng's lab, he was very interested in the overlap of the immune system and obesity. So what, what is going on with the immune system? We know that inflammation happens in obesity, um, but what, what more can we learn from these cells? Uh, so this has become a big focus, um, how, how to understand inflammation, where is it coming from, which cells are producing it, um, and how then does that lead to disease? So my work with Carrie Lu Meng um, as a postdoc mentor uh, came out, one of our papers from this work came out earlier this year in Journal of Leukocyte Biology here. So this really shows the dynamics of adipose tissue in the obesity context. So in this case, we were feeding mice high-fat diets. This is a 60% high-fat diet um, and running time courses to see what happens to the immune cells in that context and uh, what happens to the tissue itself. So one of the main things is, so this is showing a cross-section of adipose tissue, just um, sort of a binary view of this uh, in, the, in normal diet case, so in lean mice. And then looking two weeks, four weeks out on this high-fat diet, we can see a dramatic increase in the volume of adipocytes. Um, and then, of course, the stromal component, the, the interstitial cells between those adipocytes actually account for the majority of the cells within the tissue. So not only are we seeing uh, adipocyte volume increasing dramatically, but we see that those interstitial cells are changing quite a bit too. Um, and since they account for more of the actual quantity of cells, um, these become very interesting. Sure. There is a slow turnover. So we've actually done studies looking at um, pre-adipocytes, so what we call pre-adipocytes within the cell. There's kind of a fibroblastic type that will differentiate into adipocytes, and there is a slow turnover. Um, I think that it is a source of new cells, um, but how much of those contribute um, and how well they cycle through within the obesity context is really not well known. OK. So one of the things we can do with this, then we can take this tissue and digest it using enzymes and extract the cellular component. Everything that's not an adipocyte, which we call stromal vascular cells. Within that is an immune cell uh, population that we can then study. So a lot of my postdoc work I spent looking at immune cells within this context I and mean, understanding them using a lot of flow cytometry to quantify their, their numbers. So typically in flow cytometry, we use this kind of a two-dimensional plot with, uh, in this case, um, CD64, which identifies macrophages on this axis, and then CD11C on this axis, so that we can distinguish them from other tissue immune cells, in this case, dendritic cells. So macrophages lie up here, CD64 positive, and these are all of the cells within the tissue that are CD45 positive, which means they're all, all of the immune cells we couldn't collect. OK, so when we look at the macrophages, the ATMs in the tissue, we can see over a time course of high-fat diet feeding that these, their number, their quantity, increases dramatically. And we can look in a couple of different depots within the mice here. One is EWAT for epididymal white adipose tissue. The other is IWAT for inguinal, which is a subcutaneous depot. So these have um, approximate equivalents in humans of a visceral abdominal for EWAT and then subcutaneous again. So we can sort of model what, what this might look like in human. Okay, so they increase in quantity, why? There are two potential uh, sources of these cells. One is through uh, in situ uh, expansion or proliferation within the tissue itself. Uh, the other is through a blood source. So they can actually infiltrate through the blood um, based on a progenitor, which in this case would be monocytes. So monocytes can traffic into the tissue, differentiate into macrophages. And this differentiation mechanism actually, in longer term diets, 
in chronic obesity in mice, it's been shown that infiltrating cells seem to cause a lot of inflammation within the tissue and actually causally are causally involved in development of diabetes in mice. Uh, so we're now exploring this uh, population um, to see whether this quantity expansion is due to that infiltration. So we can actually study this by knocking out that infiltration mechanism. And this is a mouse model. The CCR2 knockout mouse is commonly used to do that. So if we knock out CCR2, we interfere with the ability of these cells to uh, traffic outside the bone marrow, through the blood, and into the tissue. So if we knock that out, put the mice on a high-fat diet, we still see this increase. So this seems to be independent of a classical infiltration mechanism. When we look at proliferation, so we can look at ATMs here on this axis by CD64 positive and look at KI67, which is a marker of proliferation. We can see that oops, looking at this compartment here, the KI positive ATMs, they increase over time with this high fat diet time course. So three days, seven days, 14 days, we can see uh, a significant increase in these proliferating cells. Um, so it seems like this proliferation is indeed a mechanism in this early uh, adipose tissue expansion. And I should say, when we did these studies, there, there were very few examples of um, proliferation in C2 in adipose tissue. And people were um, pr previously um, assuming that infiltration was the primary mechanism whereby these cells are maintained in tissue. Um, but since then, there have been many tissue examples of macrophages that are maintained in the tissue, the, in the tissue itself. And they're there actually resident um, from the yolk sac on in development. So this was a, um, a good addition to that data set. OK, so one of the things we wanted to know, how, how plastic is this? And when we expand this, when we hit this with the hammer of the 60% high fat diet, will it go back and will it revert when the tissue contracts again with weight loss? And so we had three sets of mice here. Uh, one is just the normal diet set. One is a set that's on high fat diet for two weeks. And then the third set is on high fat diet for two weeks and then off high fat diet to allow weight loss for two weeks. So when we look at this, we can see tissue expansion. So this is just showing the tissue itself, normalized to body weight, expanding and then contracting again with the weight loss. And we can see that the cells actually uh, proliferate as expected with that two-week high-fat diet and then revert to baseline when they undergo weight loss and the tissue contracts again. Um, so interesting. And I think noting that this context is um, it's really part of the natural function of adipose tissue. So as it expands and contracts, it naturally responds. And this is what a healthy adipose tissue should do, so as expected. Say again. This one here. OK, so this is the frequency of macrophages that are proliferating. So we can see that the they become the proliferating macrophages increase over two weeks high fat diet, and then with weight loss, that decreases back to the baseline. It is. Uh, so you, we noticed that too. Um, so it's lower than baseline when it comes back down, and that could be a real effect. Um, we did do some um, comparisons, and it did look like in some of our measures, it was significantly lower. So there could be something there, but we didn't pursue it um, didn't, any further. Uh, that's a great question. And we didn't look at specifically egress, but we did look at apoptosis to see whether that changed. And in fact, when you put them on high fat diet, apoptosis over that two weeks decreases, and then it comes back up to baseline, which was mirrors exactly what the proliferation is doing. So it seems like these cells are highly sensitive to this microenvironment and responding very ex exquisitely to adipocyte hypertrophy and contraction. 
Okay. So then we took this diet out a little bit longer just to see what was happening with the tissue at the tissue level with the adipocytes um, and trying to define sort of what are the dynamics of this tissue and when we take it out longer, what happens? Uh, so looking across uh, this time course, two weeks, four weeks, and then out to eight, eight weeks, um, out to about five months here. And we can see that the adipocytes actually reach a peak size and after that don't get any larger. And in fact, when you look at the whole adipose tissue, fat, the whole fat pad when you take it out, it actually expands and contracts. And after a while on this chronic diet, uh, they actually, the fat pads get smaller and are no longer able to expand to the degree that they did when you have a healthy tissue that's not exposed to high fat diet. Okay. So something else that was interesting we wanted to look at, people had found that lipids actually can accumulate within macrophages and this happens frequently in atherosclerosis. In the uh, macrophages that they find within those plaques seem to be lipid laden. So we wanted to look at this in adipose tissue in these early diets to see can we pinpoint a, a time when these cells accumulate lipids um, and potentially pinpoint that that is a time when, a time window when this may become a problem for the tissue. And so we actually found uh, so this is just showing in red and blue two different subsets, two different subtypes of macrophages. And in green, looking at dendritic cells. And this is the frequency of lipid high cells within that population. And then across our time course on high fat diet. And we can see that by day 28, this type of macrophages is, be is beginning to accumulate internal lipids. And this is just based on neutral lipid staining um, using a dye called lipid tox. And by 56 days, we can see both subtypes have accumulated lipids. And interestingly, this is exactly when adipocytes reach their peak size. So this could indicate some kind of uh, ectopic lipids within the tissue that the macrophages are accumulating within them. Um, and noting that ectopic lipids can be toxic to, t to cells and tissues. So this could become a big problem for the tissue. Um, and it, the macrophages may actually be responding to this. Saturated fat, unsaturated fat, other, other mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we didn't dissect diets, and I know a lot of people who do that. Um, we didn't dissect diets. This is just uh, basically a hammer, 60% high fat diet, and so 60% of the calories derived from lard, basically. Lard. Yeah. Saturated. So it's probably a lot of saturated, saturated fats. Okay, so from the data, we can begin to get an idea of how quantities of immune cells change over this time course and in early expansion of the tissue and contraction of the tissue. So when we see, we can overlay adipocyte size here over the days on high fat diet. So as adipocytes increase in size, we can see our blue macrophages here. So these are just our resident, the, the cells we think are resident macrophages in the tissue, uh, increase in quantity very early. And our red macrophages here, so these are the kind that we think are infiltrating. We think that they are um, later in chronic high fat diet, they become, they take over the uh, dominant, uh, do dominance in terms of the number of macrophages in the tissue. Um, so here they're relatively small, but at, by about 12 weeks or 14 weeks on this high fat diet, these actually take over as, as the dominant player here. Um, so we think that the resident are somewhat playing in the tissue early and maintaining uh, tissue homeostasis um, early in the high fat diets and that these red ATMs are um, become a more dominant player later. Uh, dendritic cells interestingly um, massively expand and continue to expand across this across these diets um, and of course all of these cells um, are shown to be antigen presenting cells within the tissue and seem to be interacting with T cells within the tissue and stimulating adaptive immune responses. So all of these things 
once these cells begin to change um, and become differently programmed, they can then go on and signal other immune cells and uh, begin to cause inflammation over time. OK. So in our model, we see a couple of phases of tissue growth and, um, and dynamics of the cells. So we see early proliferation here. We actually see later in these high fat diets, we see maintained proliferation within the cells. So it seems to be a mechanism that is carried, carried along with this chronic high fat diet as well. We know that this is reversible in terms of the proliferation. <coughs> But later in high fat diet, um, we don't know what that time window is um, where the tissue structure actually begins to um, have permanent changes or whether that can come back to its natural state of a healthy adipose tissue. And we see with uh, a lot of evidence of fibrosis within the tissue uh, that indicates the structure may not be able to go back once it reaches a certain point. But we don't know what those time windows are. And especially in humans, we don't know what those time windows are and um, how, can we, how can we better understand what the cells are doing in humans and uh, begin to see whether this aligns with a lot of the mouse data. We have a lot of mouse data on this, but not a lot in humans yet. OK, so our major collaborator on human adipose tissue is Robert O'Rourke in the Department of Surgery. So he has provided from his bariatric surgery patients uh, samples of adipose tissue and blood to try to better understand uh, adipose tissue and immune cells within adipose tissue. So his lab actually studies um, a lot within the adipose tissue itself and looking at adipocyte function, pre-adipocyte function. Um, and so we've both been taking advantage of this amazing resource that he's built over the last five years. Uh, the main comparisons that um, I'm doing looking at adipose tissue macrophages in humans um, and also blood cells going forward um, are the non-diabetic obese compared to diabetic obese. And there seems to be something about metabolic dysfunction in the human patients that stimulates the cells in a certain way. And again, we don't know what's causal here, but we're hoping to get more into that. OK, so he's, Robert O'Rourke has worked incredibly hard to try to get this resource up and running, um, has been providing samples for me and a number of other people, and has been publishing on fibrosis, hypertrophy, and hyperplasia. And we've worked together to get um, several papers out in this direction. One of the first things that we wanted to look at, um, and this is data with uh, Carrie Lumang, uh, looking at whole adipose tissue gene expression to try to see what is a signature. Can we compare diabetic and non-diabetic and um, see what we find? And the number one thing that came up in these pathway analyses for whole tissue was inflammation. So it seems like the diabetic obese have an inflammatory signature. And this comes up over and over again in our data. OK, so this is whole tissue. Can we get back into the actual uh, cellular components of tissue. So from human adipose tissue, just like with the mice, we can isolate and isolate these cells by digesting the tissue um, and hopefully better define. So we can digest them to a single cell level from the tissue and then do flow cytometry, flow cytometry to quantify uh, what's there and uh, which populations are changing uh, with different comparisons. So here, again, we're using this marker CD64 and looking at CD45 on this axis. Again, all immune cells are CD45 positive, And then our ATMs are also CD64 positive. So we can take that. And there really weren't good markers when we started these studies. We, we weren't sure which markers would be the best. But we found that these two markers, CD206 and CD11C, were actually very uh, good at discriminating three different populations of ATMs. And throughout, for, for brevity, I might refer to them as 206 positive, DP for double positive, and 11C here. OK, so first was to quantify these cells across a number of patients and to see whether they're associated with disease, metabolic disease. 
And the number one thing we found is that the 206 positive ATMs were associated with diabetes. So in this column, we see uh, obese with diabetes. This is obese without diabetes. And this is the lean sample. So consistently, we saw that 206 positive were found at increased frequency within our obese diabetic patients. And then we, we did a number of correlations to show that the continuous measures, such as um, HbA1c, to show uh, how well controlled glucose is, and as well as fasting blood glucose. And these correlations came out uh, that CD206 positive seems to be related to this, uh, to metabolic dysfunction. OK, so what more can we learn? And we wanted to do RNA sequencing of each of these three subtypes to get an unbiased view of, to try to get, capture an unbiased view of what's going on in these cells. And can we better define what their function is? So first, we had found, based on the data from RNA sequencing and comparing each of these three subtypes um, to each other, that the 206 ATM seemed to diverge from the other two subsets. So using just looking at differentially expressed genes, um, as well as some principal component analysis, and we had some help with um, from Rich on this one um, in bioinformatics, we find that the 206 positive do diverge. Um, and looking at a dendrogram view basically um, um, recapitulates this. So another thing that came out from these data are that looking at uh, pathway analysis, um, the 206 positive ATMs, um, when compared to the 11C positive and when compared to the double positive, diverge in terms of their expression of genes related to endocytosis and phagocytosis, um, internalization genes, basically. So here we're just showing relative gene expression in the 206, sort of ranked um, high to low, and then a comparison of the other two subtypes. And you can really see here that the other two subtypes seem to um, co-express, and they seem to be highly related compared to the 206, which diverge quite a bit. OK, so looking more at the actual genes that are related to in cell internalization, and this isn't a surprise because um, these, these cells are known to be, they're experts at internalizing and antigen presentation and these functions. So this wasn't a surprise, but how much they di diverged from the 11C positive was um, a bit unexpected. So looking at just scavenger receptors, so these receptors are involved in internalization, involved in sensing patterns in the environment, um, and taking in substances that could potentially be pathogenic. Um, so looking at these scavenger receptors, we can see the majority of them here are expressed much more in the 206 positive compared to the 11C. Um, and similar finding for endocytosis genes. They seem to be expressed much more in the 206 positive compared to the 11C. OK, so thinking toward antigen presentation, so if they have high internalization and lysosomal processing, do they have high antigen presentation as well? And when we use flow cytometry to look at HLA-DR, which is an antigen presentation, so we're looking at HLA-DR on the surface of these proteins, um, we can see that the cells that are low in HLA-DR um, are here, and the cells that are high in HLA-DR are here. And we can see that the 206 represent um, a majority of those cells that are HLA-DR high. So this confirmed in our minds that, that, that these cells seem to be higher in uh, environmental, environmental sensing and also internalization processing and potentially antigen presentation. And this antigen presentation is also has been found in mice to be important in that development of diabetes, like I mentioned. So um, this was sort of a confirmation that this may be involved in humans as well. Similar effect on both phagocytosis and the scavenger receptor. One being receptor mediated, the other being non-receptor mediated. Say it again. Does this antigen, is that related to the 
scavenger receptor predominance and phagocytosis predominance of the um, yeah, and I think so. In these cells, they have definitely multiple um, multiple mechanisms for internalizing. Right, duplication of, of, of the end result. Mm -hmm. one of right, two. right, exactly, exactly. And we're not sure. We haven't pursued um, functional studies to see which pathway is is more active in these cells and and how they're internalizing. But um, the end result would be lysosomal processing, and then present antigen presentation. Okay, so one of the things that I've been really interested in and kind of bridging from my PhD work, which is all in uh, cell-based therapy for muscular dystrophy. So I did a lot of actually cell reprogramming to produce cells that would actually have a therapeutic impact on muscle disease. Um, so I'm very interested in cell reprogramming and how can we steer cells toward a desired fate, toward a desired state that can actually be therapeutic. Uh, so I wanted to look at transcription factors within these um, expression analyses and to see uh, which ones might potentially be key players within each of these subtypes and maintainers, I should, maintainers of the state of each of those subtypes, um, 206 positive in particular. So we looked at all the differentially expressed transcription factors, um, which ones were up in the 206 positive cells and which ones are up in the 11C positive cells. And working with the Indica Rajapaksa's lab and Scott Ronquist in Indica's lab, um, so trying to understand which transcription factors not only were expressed, but which ones had targets within the differentially expressed gene set. Um, and the ones that are starred fall into that category and had a number, much higher number of binding sites across the differentially expressed genes. Um, so we're continuing to work with these data sets to try to extract from this what might be key transcription factors in maintaining each of these cell states with the eye toward how can we modify these in the future. OK, so taking a step back, um, I also wanted to keep in mind this whole myeloid lineage. So uh, we know that myeloid cells can come from circulation. Um, monocytes, in particular, traffic to sites of inflammation and can differentiate into macrophages and dendritic cells um, and contribute to whatever process is going on in those tissues. So I wanted to get a better sense of monocytes um, with the understanding that tissue macrophages may be the end result of, of uh, where those cell, cells go and what processes, processes that they influence. So we know that 206 ATMs seem to correlate with metabolic disease. They diverge from the other subtypes. Um, we have an idea of what their function might be um, and are continuing these studies. But stepping back toward monocytes, um, and the K that I wrote sort of focused uh, almost, uh, almost everything on monocytes because I wanted to step back and um, look at the blood cells and whether there was a connection between these and the tissue macrophages, because this connection is really not that well established, and I wanted to get a sense of how these cells in the blood are programmed, and this would also um, have relevance for things like atherosclerosis, where we see um, cells that are programmed differently homing to, to different sites in the body, not just adipose tissue, but plaques um, and other sites as well. So in lean tissue, or in the lean condition, myeloid cells um, that express scavenger receptors seem to be highly sensitive to this environment. So our, the idea was that in obesity, you get this, uh, this microenvironment of obesity ligands that stimulates to cell, the cells, and they may upregulate scavenger receptors and become even more sensitive. This Processing would result in inflammatory mediators that would increase in inflammation within tissues and uh, eventually lead to metabolic disease. The second part of that is that we wanted to find, find things that could modify these cells. Um, and so I started working with Lonnie Shea, 
who has developed a series of nanoparticle formulations um, that are for that he has used in mouse cells to modify their phenotype and modify response um, uh, within whole animal models. So looking at monocytes then, considering this, um, I wanted to, uh, in preliminary data, sort of get a sense of what's there. So this is from uh, one of our obese patients. And I had done flow cytometry looking for classical monocyte markers. And it's known that there are three subtypes of uh, human monocytes based on expression of CD16 and CD14. And we call those non-classical here, intermediate here, and classical monocytes here. And it's known that these actually can change proportion and change overall quantity in obesity. Um, so we had um, a pretty interesting foundation for beginning to look at these cells. So how can we approach this? And with the Shea lab, uh, we wanted to look in initial studies at a couple of different types of nanoparticles. And these are um, pretty small particles on the order of 300 to 500 nanometers, um, looking at polylactic acid and polylactide coglycolide. So these two varying their charges and varying um, uh, their, their size. Uh, we wanted to understand how they might interact with these cells, which come from an inflammatory environment. So the goal was then to test interaction of these in the, human, in the cells from the human patients. OK. So from this, from this study, so I basically took nanoparticles and incubated them with these uh, whole blood, whole blood cells. Um, and from this, we can see that the classical monocytes here interact much more than the non-classical. And this might be expected because the classical monocytes express more scavenger receptors. And scavenger receptors are thought to interact with the nanoparticles in the mouse cells. This has been shown, and the Shea lab has shown this. Um, that they interact with scavenger receptors like Marco um, to internalize particles. So uh, looking at this in the human cells now, in the human system, uh, we're seeing similar, similar outcomes. OK. So what was more striking to me when we did this study, we looked at obese compared to the obese diabetic monocytes. Um, we threw the nanoparticles in, and in fact, they interacted a lot more with the obese diabetic monocytes. And this is just getting on all monocytes. Um, so this was a, a bit surprising, but perhaps not, because some of our other data in the whole tissue had shown an increase in scavenger receptor gene expression. Um, and so this suggested that potentially these cells have upregulated scavenger receptors I mean, are responding very differently to their environment. So we're hoping with this tissue resource to perform RNA sequencing and high c to get a really solid sense of how these cells become programmed in obesity, and then use that data to inform experiments about how can we modify that phenotype. So we know we think that they become more inflammatory. And we know from the mouse studies they become inflammatory and cause diabetes. So how can we modulate these phenotypes uh, in the human cells? So um, I've been lucky that um, I've begun to work during my postdoc. I started working more with uh, Indica. And um, we worked, I was included within this paper where we were looking for how can we better predict transcription factors that control cell, cell state? Um, and for this, we were looking specifically at reprogramming one cell into another. So how can we get a skeletal muscle from a fibroblast? How can we get a cardiomyocyte from a fibroblast? Um, but then looking ahead to specific disease phenotypes, how can we get an anti-inflammatory phenotype from a pro-inflammatory phenotype? And can we modify that effectively? And with our nanoparticle data, it looks like we're moving in that direction. And hopefully, we can um, 
um, hopefully we can bolster those with additional studies. So I'd just like to thank uh, my postdoc mentors um, in the Lumang lab, the Work lab, um, and everyone in there, and then also the Rajapaksa lab for including me so generously in their work, um, and Lonnie Shea's lab, of course, um, computational medicine for all their support, and of course our funding. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. So in your monocyte studies, so are these monocytes being recruited to, to the adipose tissue macrophages, or they are circular, circulatory? So the idea is that uh, in mice, it's shown that they do migrate to adipose tissue. The pro-inflammatory cells migrate to adipose tissue and differentiate into macrophages there, um, and dendritic cells as well, causing inflammation and then causing diabetes. So all of these studies in mice are shown to be causal, but that link between pro-inflammatory monocytes to pro-inflammatory macrophages, ATMs, is not well established in humans. Um, so we don't actually have much information on that. Obviously, we can't do lineage tracing and, and, and staining and following in humans. Um, so we're trying to get at that using the data, um, using the data that we have, and hopefully some genomics in the future. Then where is your monocyte collected? From the blood. Right, yeah. So we're just looking at these monocytes within the obesity microenvironment of the blood. And we're actually also collecting um, blood plasma, for example, to see how that affects monocyte differentiation looking long term to see whether that programming is maintained long term as these cells differentiate in vitro um, and applying that blood plasma from obese patients and obese patients with diabetes to see whether which whether there are factors that are circulating in there that can influence that process. And they can, they can go through the cycle of fibrosis and then non-alcoholic cirrhosis and then eventually uh, HCC, right? So I'm wondering if the, uh, the mechanisms by which you get the infiltration and the change in, in phenotype of those adipocytes may be similar to what might happen, or does it, is it similar to what might happen? Right, and I know so. Right, right, and you know lipid toxicity and all of these things. And I, I think having so I, I know in the Lumang lab they had looked a lot more at liver. I didn't, I didn't myself, um, but I think definitely there is um, immune cell component there. Um, and so things like Kupfer cells in the liver and, right, right, exactly. So, um, but in terms of the dynamics of recruitment within the liver, I don't know. Yeah, but that's a, that's a really good point. And obviously, if all of these things are affecting system-wide, adipose tissue would not be the only place that we see, that, you know, that we, that, that we would see this um, pro-inflammatory contribution. Because in mice, if you give a high-fat diet, say 60% of calories, if, depending upon um, you know, what you what you use, whether it's a drug or whether it's you know going back to a normal diet, everything, they they can very rapidly respond, similar to what you saw in the episode. So mm -hmm. it's it's amazing how the body can, uh, can reprogram itself in some way then right. to try to normalize the situation as opposed to making it worse. Right, and I think that I've been very fascinated by that time window because we don't know the time at which it becomes a problem. You know, there, there's a normal response of our system to obesity and it can, um, you know, normalize and accommodate for it, but for how long? And in the chronic case, we found that in mice, as soon as you get to that fibrotic stage, we don't know if you can go back. Um, I don't, I don't think we don't know. I don't think Right. And Although liver probably regenerates uh, 
the more the generative tissue will help them. That's possible. And I, I think the, so some of the studies also out of the Lumang lab by Brian Zamoron, so he had studied uh, adipose tissue longer term diets with weight loss and found that there were things called crown like structures that we see appear, but then they usually disappear with weight loss. But he found that on the chronic diets, they didn't disappear. And in fact, they became more numerous. Um, so, th so these are lingering, persistent changes that we see. Um, that we don't know when and if they resolve, and especially in humans, we don't have that information. If you have stellate cells in the, in the liver, can they be bring back? Or can you cause the reprogramming like this you're talking about, depending upon whether it's diet or transcription factors that mm -hmm. change them back to be different for some of the Right, right. And can we, um, can we modulate that process to? To make it better and prevent at least progression of liver disease toward HCC. Because, as you know, as we talked about, the uh, HCC liver, liver disease means that they can cut us over by paying the liver to the end of it. Most of them do it over the years. And I just want to get the most support. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, yeah. like, it's not like the blue doctor that it, it, it diagnoses and then says, mm -hmm. there's no. Biomarkers, right, suddenly, right. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of people like that. They got it, they got it, and it was discovered after infection due to colorectal cancer. This is exactly And, what and that's 40%, 40% of people who get colorectal cancer also, okay. have, also have medicine. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is exactly what happened. And that's scary. My colleague is in my scary, terrible story. Yeah. And, you know, I had a good friend who's 50, 48 years old, and he had colorectal cancer. And, Diagnosed in November, dead in January. The liver, the liver mess killed him. That's what we're looking at. Is it's, 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 it's very complex, very good. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And the, the, the liver was a mess. So. And it's hard to think of late a little bit of liver that might be affected. And what can you do to actually prevent the weakening? Yeah. Well, if you can find something to do that, that, that would be. A major contribution to liver disease. Yeah. Rapidly emerging. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so the the other question I had is the uh, when I look into your RNA seq analysis. Uh, looks like the uh, transcription factor you're looking at mostly affect either. Uh, metabolism or the uh, scavenger receptors, but I think I don't see much of the transcription, many transcription factors that directly affect the inform inf information. Is that a correct observation I saw from your analysis? Um, right. So no. I didn't, I didn't show everything, um, but I think we we haven't done a rundown on inflammatory. Um, mediators basically and um, transcription factors that would be directly involved in inflammation some of these were involved in we found a lot that was involved in polarization in particular um, but we haven't looked at um, the inflammatory or uh, comparing um, for example diabetic and non-diabetic on the cell level so we haven't done those comparisons yet and i hope with this Funding, I can I can continue on and produce more of these data sets so we can get a good handle on um, which is there a subtype that is pro-inflammatory um, and which one responds the most um, in terms of uh, promoting inflammation. Um, and this again is relevant to um, not only the adipose and diabetes but atherosclerosis. So. Do you think the uh, the adipose tissue was that enlarged and from that inflamed, that it's not just an autochrome effect or a serotonin effect, it could be an endocrine effect on the rest of the body? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, not just immune cells, obviously. They, so the adipocytes themselves would have an influence on that in terms of leptin and adiponectin and, and these hormones that, um, you know, would have far reaching effects. And I think people have been trying to get at that in. in human blood as well to try to identify what those factors are. Um, so we'll see in our human plasma wh whether we're having an impact on the immune cells. I'm really curious to see that. <laughs>